The word of God this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Please give your full, uninvited attention to the reading of God's holy word. The parable of the Good Samaritan. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend... I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the reading of God's word. At this time, will we now give our attention to the preaching of God's word? Good morning, Christ Central. I'm Andrew, I'm one of the pastors, and it's my great joy to continue our Shalom series uh, with a really important topic for us, ministry indeed. And it's hard to nail down even a text for this topic because I think the whole Bible, cover to cover, this theme is everywhere. There are so many needs, right? The poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, the needy. And I think today there's maybe no more fitting lesson for us than this parable of the Good Samaritan. I see an expert, an expert in the Jewish law. He approaches Jesus with a question. What do I need to get eternal life? What do you have to do to get eternal life? Jesus may be a little bit sarcastic, says, you're, you're the expert. You know. You should know. Well, what does it say? And he responds, okay, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord, all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And that's right, one more, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, okay, go do it. And the lawyer, probably thinking, right, it said he was trying to justify himself. He's he's thinking seriously, okay, I think I can do this, right? I got the first commandment down. I'm pretty religious. I obey. Uh, But the second, just to clarify, follow-up question, Jesus, uh, who, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus uses this question to teach him and us a very important lesson today about the ministry indeed. And we're going to start our first point today. Who is my neighbor? We're going to answer this. In our parable, this is implied it's a Jewish man. A Jewish man is beaten, right? He's going down this dangerous road. He's beaten and battered by robbers. That road is notorious to be dangerous, bandits, robbers, sketchy area, shady neighborhood. And there he gets beaten, mugged, stripped of everything. He's left for dead. And then we get some important characters, and we want to pay attention to to these characters. First, a priest comes. A priest comes, sees this man, and he he takes a long road, right? He goes around. He avoids him. A Levite comes, does the same thing. 
Now, these characters are important and interesting because they're the people, the very people that you would expect to do something, right? They're both religious officials, Jewish leaders, the good guys, the people who had every reason to do the right thing, but they didn't. Instead, we get another character, and this should be shocking. It's a Samaritan. It's shocking because Jews and Samaritans, they hated each other. They had a horrible relationship. It might have been if you could imagine a white supremacist lying on the road, and white men came and they left, but a black man stopped. It was meant to have that effect. The most unlikely person stopped and showed compassion. And not just any kind of compassion. He went above and beyond, right? The extent he took care of the wounds. He put him on his own animal, which implied that the Samaritan walked. Who knows? God knows how far. To an inn. And then he paid two denarii. Two denarii, which is about two days' wages, two full days' wages for this stranger. And of course, he kept the tab open. Anything else that you need, I'll cover. Costly in every way. Time, energy, resources. And then there's that question again. Who was the neighbor to this Jewish man on the road? Who was this neighbor? You see, we might expect the priest and the Levite. They might have been literal neighbors, right? They're Jews. They, they're, part, they're countrymen. Samaria's out of the way. But Jesus does something very interesting. He reframes this question, right? Notice, he reframes this question. It's not so much about who was the neighbor, but who behaved like a neighbor. And Jesus charges us to be a neighbor to anyone we come across in need, right? So the answer to that first question, who is our neighbor? Jesus implies anyone you meet along the way, even your enemies, Notice how the Samaritan, he doesn't ask questions. He doesn't kind of interrogate like, what, what, what is that guy doing there? Well, let me check his race or nationality. Uh, what if he's in that situation because it's his fault? He made poor decisions. Maybe he made a stupid choice and that's how he ended up there. Right? Notice that the Samaritan doesn't look into whether this man is a deserving needy type or an undeserving needy type? You see, for us, there's there's a, a long list, a laundry list of reasons why people might end up in difficult or, or hard situations, right? I think you can kind of boil it down to three big categories. First, it's the sins of others. You think of groups that are uh, oppressed, they're victims of injustice, maybe unjust social structures. Second, It might be because of natural disasters or accidents, right? Think earthquakes, hurricanes, car accident, uh, COVID, sickness. And the third category, personal sin, personal bad choices, just bad decisions made, right? Chose to just overdose on drugs. But notice, right, notice that the Samaritan doesn't label people into that category of needy deserving or needy undeserving. And it's a reminder Jesus treats us the same way, doesn't he? He doesn't say, I'm dying for the deserving sinners, not the undeserving sinners. Because we know that would not be mercy at all. Right, so the bottom line, there's no undeserving people Deed ministry ought not to discriminate or show partiality. So next, our second point then is, all right, so what do neighbors do? Well, neighbors meet needs with deeds. Uh, You may have heard people say, just preach the gospel. Just, Just preach the gospel, and that's the role of us as Christians, the church. And that's important. It's true, but it's a half truth. 
See, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, 18, it says this, But if anyone has the world's goods, goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Not just word and talk. Because sometimes, if we're honest, we know talk, talk is cheap. Deeds often are far more costly. For our sake today, I, I've given us two categories of deeds. And these are working definitions, meaning, you know, they might be adjusted. I've just taken the liberty to, to craft a definition we can start. It's a, a starting point for us. So the first, deed, deeds of mercy. And I've defined this practical compassion shown toward someone experiencing the effects of sin. Practical compassion, because just feeling compassion, uh, oh man, I feel so sorry, and my heart goes out to them. Uh, but, not, but no follow-up doesn't really do much, right? We need the heart and action married together towards someone experiencing the effects of sin. And there are many effects. Right? Deeds of mercy, some of the categories may be physical, material needs. Maybe it's emotional, psychological, mental needs. Maybe it's social, relational needs. The list is long. Second category, deeds of justice. I've defined this, establishing and upholding right, just order in the world. Proper order, fair treatment, right? And that implies to speak out or act against unfair treatment or discrimination when people face injustice, right? You might think maybe in the story of this good Samaritan, justice would be catching those robbers. Or how do we lower crime in this area? How do we reform some of these social structures or systems that led this Jewish man to be there in the first place? How do we create a safer, better road system from Jerusalem to Jericho? Maybe it was we could also say to com combat racism between Jews and Samaritans. And of course, these two categories of deeds are so closely tied. Because victims of injustice, oppression, are usually the very people that really need your mercy. That really need advocacy. That really need us to speak up. A voice to the voiceless, eyes to the blind, feet to the lame. See, deed ministry is such a crucial part of shalom, of holistic shalom, meeting the needs of entire person. Right? This is why Jesus taught, and that's it. No, he taught, but he also healed. He served. Right? Word and deed, evangelism and mercy, they were, they're interdependent. They go hand in hand. And often they go hand in hand in this way where mercy beautifies the word. It, it adorns the gospel. It helps people to become more receptive to it. You might say this, the, that ministry of the word inspires deeds of justice and mercy and then deeds of justice and mercy lend credibility to the words of the gospel. It helps it to be more beautiful and attractive. You see, in uh, moments that preceded great times of revival in history, a lot of those seasons were those filled with radical acts of mercy by Christians. In AD 361, there was an emperor, a Roman emperor named Julian. He tried to revive paganism. He wanted to bring back the old gods, pagan religion. But he quickly found that the older religion wasn't as popular anymore. No, a lot of people lost interest, but there was another group gaining a lot of interest that was growing in popularity. It was the Christians. Why? 
he writes in a letter. He says this, For it is disgraceful that when no Jew ever has to beg, and the impious Galileans, Christians, support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men see that our people lack aid from us. See, interesting, he makes even this distinction. The Jews, they, they gave aid to their own, but only to their own members. But Christians, they gave aid to all. And they did it even better than the Romans did it themselves. They did welfare better than the Roman government. And that was powerful. That was winsome. That was beautiful. In the early church, there's also uh, a season where there were great plagues in the uh, third century. And a church historian by the name of Eusebius, he, he notes this season where St. Dionysius says this, that uh, Christians, they were the first ones on the scene during these plagues. That they were quick to help the sick, to minister to them. And he noted a lot of them died in the process. But they died serenely happy, at peace. He notes this, that they drew on themselves the sickness of their neighbors, cheerfully accepting their pains. Many, in nursing and curing others, transferred their death to themselves, and they died in their stead. You see, he notes the heathens, the non-religious, they responded very differently in an opposite way. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed sufferers away. They fled from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead. They treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping to avoid the contagion. You see, in these examples, I think it's pretty clear who proved to be a neighbor. Uh, I had the great privilege of being uh, the missions pastor at Christ Central the last few years. I transitioned out in the last year. And it's been a joy to see ministry done across the world in many ways, so heavily reliant upon ministry indeed. One of our longtime partners, maybe the longest, is our partnership with Paraguay. And if I know many of you have gone on a short-term trip there, and the church there, the theme verse is Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Nacido para servir, right? Born to serve. And there on the screen, there's uh, two... Uh, images of newsletter. This is the most recent newsletter, which really highlight the ways we partner. One of them is the Mombarete Scholarship Ministry. It began over 10 years ago, and it wasn't started by a staff member. It wasn't started by a pastor, but it was started by one of you, a lay member who went on a trip, saw needs, and tried to meet them. And she came back and thought, hey, we, we have some resources. Maybe we can contribute in this way. And started this scholarship ministry. And there are some stories, countless stories, of students that wouldn't be able to attend this school without those sponsorships. And those students were able to get a good education, but even beyond that, a Christian education. And many of them came to know Jesus. Many of them came to understand the gospel. Itororo, a church plant in a very poor area, (coughs) excuse me, we partner with them in supporting a soup kitchen ministry. And it's one of those areas where they lack even the most basic necessities. And one of the things that they've sought to do is to give meals every week. So the children could come, eat, and also study the Bible together. Right? So many opportunities to meet needs. And it's not just that. They've also sought to provide adult classes to help prepare uh, people for jobs, for work, for those who didn't have any. And in the past, there were even medical teams to go provide clinics in places that had no access to any type of health care. 
You know, this past week I asked uh, the missionaries' two daughters, Michelle and Ara, why are you pursuing the career path that you're pursuing? And it's interesting what they said. Ara is, has entered the med field, and she's largely done that because she's seen so many of those medical teams go and the good that they do and how many people were warmed up to the gospel. And she wants to do the same. Michelle, my wife, uh, in college she studied and always wanted to get involved in nonprofit work. She participated uh, in an internship for Samaritan's Purse, and she's always wanted to be involved in community development. And that's because she saw their ministry in Paraguay doing that weekly. So for parents... If you want to see your kids maybe grow a heart to serve, to embody the gospel in that way, sometimes there's no better way than to expose them to ministry indeed. You see, a lot of people, before they can understand their deepest need is spiritual, they have more urgent, pressing, immediate needs that need to be met. Ministry indeed often opens doors for the ministry in word. And I think this is so fundamental. This is one more interesting thing. Uh, think about the first instance where gospel ministry and word is done, right? To Adam and Eve, where God, after they've sinned, he gives them promises, and that's it. No, what comes after? Right? He also does something for them. You might say the first act of Mercy ministry. He clothes them. He clothes them. He provides that basic need for them. Now, ministry indeed, easier said than done. If we're honest, even in preparing this, it, it was hard. Right? And so this brings us third point. Why deed ministry is hard? I want to explore a little bit. First reason I think it's hard is because it can be very costly and uncomfortable. Right? Prayer and worship, vitally important. So important. We do this every Sunday. We gather but if we're honest, much less costly. Much less costly than deeds of justice and mercy. I've heard this helpful distinction where one pastor has said, there's a difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. To simply peacekeep, right, just to, to keep things as is, it's comfortable, let's not rock the boat, let's not stir up trouble, let's just keep things as is. Right? We're comfortable. That's, that's probably the idol of our time. Comfort. Right? Some of us, we live our lives with that goal. Make enough so I can be comfortable. Make enough so that the people I love can be comfortable. So it's not a surprise that there's really no reason to peace make because peacemaking requires you to get your hands dirty in deeds of justice and mercy. In other words, to be a peacemaker sometimes will require you to actually lose a sense of peace. It might require you to give up that personal sense of peace so you can help others achieve a deeper sense of peace. It's inconvenient. It's costly, uncomfortable. It involves sacrifice. But wait, I have, I have needs too, though. You got to understand, I got needs and I think I can help others more once I have maybe more time, more, more energy, more finances. If you're thinking that, I want to read to you this, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1 through 4. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. And get this, pay close attention, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. In other words, these Macedonian Christians, they were poor, and not just poor, extremely poor poor, but they gave generously. It was their joy, abundant joy, 
to be able to bear burdens in this way. I think one of the forms mercy can take, maybe one of the more obvious ones, is financial giving. How much should I give? How much is enough? All right, I don't have an answer for you, okay? I'm not going to give a specific or a percentage, but I, I think this is a good question to ask ourselves. This is a question I'm asking myself. Do you feel like you're bearing a burden at all? Or is it negligible? Does it not impact you much? It's not really, the amount you give isn't really a sacrifice at all. Because I think built into bearing burdens implies it ought to cost you, shouldn't it? It cost you a little bit. I think for some of us, where we need to be more uncomfortable being too comfortable. Because maybe comfort has become our God and our eyes are no longer on Jesus. Second reason, we we lack understanding of the gospel. Second reason why deed ministry is hard is because we just lack proper understanding of the gospel. Maybe we take for granted, all I have is mine. God, it's it's not really yours. I, I don't think we'd ever say that, but functionally, do you live that way? Pastor Robert McChain says this regarding Christians and the poor. Would you soak this in? And I fear that there may be many hearing me who may know well that they are not Christians because they do not love to give. To give largely and liberally, not grudging at all, requires a new heart. An old heart would rather part with its lifeblood than its money. Oh, my friends, enjoy your money. Make the most of it. Give none of it away. Enjoy it quickly, for I can tell you, you will be beggars throughout eternity. What Pastor McChain is saying is that more than for the poor, I'm concerned about you, those who are unconcerned for the poor. You see, those who come to understand that they are spiritually poor, will be drawn towards the materially poor, the emotionally poor, the relationally poor. The gospel exposes our neediness, and as it exposes our neediness, it'll draw us to identify more with the needy. And this is our last point, our need exposed. You see, Jesus' main goal was not to get the lawyer to see, oh, there's so many needs. There's always a lot of needs, right? No, his main goal was to get this lawyer and to get us to see our own need. Before the question, who is my neighbor, Jesus goes back to the original question. Let's remember. Let's remember that original question. What must I do to have eternal life? And of course, this lawyer, and so often we, we try to justify ourselves. We want to do good enough, but Jesus sets such a high bar, sets a high bar of what it means to love a neighbor, to show us you can't, you can't live up to that high bar. Imagine, I want you to imagine, um, right, this scene, a beaten, battered person lying on the road, stripped naked, Maybe smelly, maybe a little bit dirty, maybe in their own urine, lying in their urine. A little bit gross. It's kind of gross. You kind of avoid that. You don't want to be around that. And he says, that's you. That's you. That's me. He exposes our true condition that you're not spiritually elite. You're not spiritually upper middle class. No, you're spiritually poor. Poor in spirit, no power, no influence, no way to get yourself out of that predicament of sin. But along came, along came the truly good Samaritan. And eternal life, it comes from acknowledging that that good Samaritan is in fact Jesus. That he had compassion on us, his enemies, He didn't distance himself from us. He didn't avoid us, take the long way 
But he drew close. He drew oh so near to pay the full price to give us shalom. And it would cost him. It was costly. So costly that it would cost him his whole life, his entire life, his life on the cross. You see, he who was rich became poor so that you and I might be rich in him. And Jesus so identifies with the poor, he knows what it's like to be oppressed, to be needy, to be beaten and battered, to be stripped naked, to die on the cross penniless as a criminal. Talk about the worst form of injustice. And he went through that. So those going through that know that they have him as their biggest advocate. And he charges us to champion their cause as well. You see, those who understand this, who understand mercy in this way, it'll change our complacency to compassion. It'll turn our apathy to attentiveness where we want to go and meet needs. And it'll do so from the right motivation, not virtue signaling, not performative action, but from genuine care and concern. Genuine care and concern because those who know mercy personally will show mercy personally. And those who have obtained eternal life will lay down their lives so that others can have it too. Just two practical considerations before we close. First, some of us need to look for needs. Maybe we're so insulated, we're just so shy, we just aren't aware. And for those of us who aren't aware, you got to start with this question, where is my neighbor? Here's a chart by Tim Keller in his book, Ministries of Mercy. A helpful chart with a bunch of people groups that have a lot of needs. Think about a few of them. Maybe pick one. One to look into more. Are there a group of that kind of people in your area that might benefit from your help? That you might be perfectly positioned to serve and show mercy to? Of course, another helpful start. Our church has opportunities for mercy. I know Pastor Jimmy so intentionally made it so all our small groups uh, are required to be involved and participate in two mercy events per year. And it's because we believe that mercy is not optional. It's essential for every believer. And there are a lot of opportunities. I know some of you were at Love Fullerton a couple weeks, maybe last week. And that was a great opportunity to, to connect and show mercy together. And of course, if there are those of you here who have a lot of needs, needs that need to be met, please, please, Reach out, talk to us, email our office. We would love to help meet those needs. Second, some of us need to stop looking at needs and start meeting them. Some of us are on the other spectrum where we're so overwhelmed by our news feeds, social media feeds. There's just so many needs in the world, and it, it's almost paralyzing where I can't do it all. And sometimes we respond, I can't do everything, so I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. Sometimes we focus so much on the global, the international, everything going around, that we neglect more of the local. Where sometimes our greatest contribution can be. Maybe for some of you, for some of us, it's to get to know our actual neighbors. Start small, but just start. And don't wait on others to start. Notice how the Good Samaritan didn't wait for the larger group or the church or to start. No, he acted as an individual, right? You don't need to wait on people to start showing mercy. And of course, all of you, all of us have unique burdens desires and passions, things that excite you, that, that you wake up getting energized, thinking, man, I would love to do that and be a part of that. We're all different. 
We have a diversity of gifts and desires, and we need you to play your part. We all need to play our part because there are many needs that need to be met. And as you engage in ministry, indeed, you'll be surprised that it'll benefit you too. This is an interesting verse that I came across in preparation for this sermon. Isaiah 58 verse 10, it reads this, If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. Interesting Maybe one of the best ways to get over depression, right? I know depression's complex, but maybe one of the ways for some in that place, one of the ways to get out of it is to be more involved in meeting the needs of others. Ministry indeed. That when Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive, maybe that's true. That when you give and you serve, that you'll find out, wow, that's such a blessing for me. You know, I'd go beyond that to even argue participating in deeds of justice and mercy is maybe the best way to experience God. That maybe you feel I'm so distant uh, from God. It's been such a long time since I've felt his nearness. And I want to ask you that question. If God's heart has always been for the lowly, the most needy, Shouldn't we expect to find him there? That maybe some of us don't really experience a whole lot of God because we don't venture to where God has called us to, where God's heart is naturally drawn. You see, some of you, like me, when we hear a message like this, we can feel bad. Like, dang, I suck. I'm a bad Christian. Maybe some of you are asking that question. I don't even know if I am a Christian. And some of you may need to reckon with that and really ask yourself. But I do think a lot of us fall in this category of we're just so forgetful. And that's why we need these reminders. We need these moments, these sermons that jolt to us spiritually awake, that get our our blood going again, the creative juices of, man, I forgot, I want to I wanna start to meet some needs. I want to get involved. I want to get my hands dirty, even if it might cost me a little bit and be a little uncomfortable. I want to end with the Lord's charge to us all, also to myself, from the passage today. Verse 36 and 37, it reads, Which of these three do you think Prove to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Christ central, brothers, sisters, may you go and do likewise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, after hearing uh, your word in this way, May we not stay passive. Would your spirit light our hearts ablaze again, fan into flame our faith, an active faith that seeks to meet the needs of a broken world. And as we do that, as we engage in the ministry in need, would it open up inroads for the ministry of the word and would many people come to know and see the savior we so love who's met our deepest need we pray these things in his name amen